Okay, seems things have slowed down now. So um, hi everyone, welcome to this Open Apparel Registry information session. My name is Phoebe Ewan and I'm joined here today by Katie Shaw of Open Apparel Registry. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about our respective organisations and then also talk specifics about this particular tool um, which is designed to bring greater transparency to supply chains. So looking forward to hearing more about the tool very soon from Katie. Um, but just a couple of things before we kick off. Um, if you could please keep your lines on mute as we have quite a few people on the call today. We will have plenty of time at the end of this session for questions and answers. Um, so please feel free to uh, put the questions into the chat box, either direct them to uh, the Mekon Club or to uh, myself, and we will make sure that we address those at the end of the session. Um, just so you know as well, this webinar is being recorded um, and we will be sharing the recording with all of the registered participants at the end of this session also. So if we go onto the first slide, please, Kat. Just to start off with, um, for those of you that are maybe less familiar with our work, I'd first introduce the Mekong Club. Um, so we're hosting today's session, uh, but we have made the OAR tool accessible via our website as part of an ongoing partnership collaboration with the OAR team. Um, so to access the tool, you can either go directly to the OAR website or you can access the tool via the Mekong Club toolkits page. We are an NGO, we are based out of Hong Kong, and we focus on empowering businesses to create a slave-free world. We really believe that working in a positive and collaborative way with the private sector is absolutely crucial in order to address the issue of modern slavery. Um, companies we find often have the drive um, and the enthusiasm to tackle this issue, but may lack the guidance, the tools or the expertise in order to effectively attack, tackle this issue both within their own operations and a more kind of industry wide uh, scale. So we're very much here to help and here to support companies. We believe in positive collaboration and we believe that uh, there are many opportunities to develop tools and resources to better equip companies to combat this crime. So if we focus on, oh, if we, if we move to the next slide, sorry. Um, on the screen here, you can see uh, a number of the members of the Mekong Club Business Association. Um, so we are a membership based organization. We work with a wide range of industries. Um, so you'll see here we have finance companies, we have hospitality companies, we have retailers, manufacturers, technology companies, all of which face different issues when it comes to modern slavery. Um, we bring these organizations together on a regular basis to discuss the challenges that they're facing, not just within their own operations, but on a kind of more industry-wide level. Um, and we work to build tools and resources to help uh, equip them to better deal with these challenges, as well as partner with organizations like OAR to provide some of the best practice examples of what is already out there um, for, for, for them to use. So when it comes to uh, the issue that we're tackling, if we move on to the next slide, just to talk a little bit about modern slavery. Um, so there, there are some quite common misconceptions around modern slavery, and this is really a kind of umbrella term that covers a whole range of different uh, issues, different types of exploitation. Um, it goes beyond simply, you know, pay being low, for example. Um, people are held in modern slavery in the world today through many different means. So we've got a few examples on the screen here of the kinds of issues that, that companies are facing. One of the largest drivers of modern slavery is that of high recruitment fees. Um, so workers may be paying thousands of dollars in order to secure a job within a factory, for example. Um, often these fees are hidden. It's not always very apparent um, to the end buyer or to the, to the company that's, that's retailing the goods that fees have been paid within the production process. And this is often made worse by murky supply chains, so where you have multiple different actors within the supply chain exploiting workers at different levels. Uh, we see issues with fraudulent employment contracts, promises being made that can't be kept, 
uh, issues with wages being uh, being confiscated or wage deductions being made to workers, as well as issues around uh, identification documents being withheld. Um, so, for example, workers' passports may be taken away from them as a means to control their freedom of movement. And then we also see issues around living standards, which may not necessarily be a direct uh, modern slavery issue, but can often indicate that there are wider issues within, within the, the workforce. So if we move to the next slide, considering how modern slavery impacts business and why we see such an interest um, from companies in this particular issue, um, why companies uh, join, join working groups like the Mekong Club's working groups. Now, of course, um, first and foremost, it's the right thing to do. This is a very human issue. Um, you, we're seeing millions of workers in supply chains and potential exploitation situations. Engaging with this topic head on can create a workforce that is happy and is fairly employed. Um, additionally, consumers are increasingly caring a lot about this topic. Um, so uh, we're seeing trends in social media, we're seeing trends in, in, in the news, we're seeing trends in terms of buying behaviors, all pointing to the fact that consumers are wanting more ethically produced goods and they're demanding more accountability from the companies that they choose to buy from. And we're also seeing uh, increases in legislation. Uh, so examples including the UK and Australian Modern Day Slavery Act, increased legislation coming out of the European Union, uh, legislation coming out of America, all very directly requiring companies to take actions to demonstrate that they are committed to, to combating modern slavery. Uh, and a big part of this is, is requiring companies to demonstrate their understanding of their own supply chains. Um, so, 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 so committing to projects like the OAR, uh, demonstrating that they have uh, transparency, that they understand where they're getting their goods from and where their risk may lie within their own supply chain. And finally, uh, I'd like to touch on ESG as well. So on the next slide, uh, we'll see a couple of publications that the Mekong Club has recently been involved in. Um, and I mean, we're, we're seeing uh, modern slavery within ESG as just an increasingly important topic. It's, it's coming up increasingly often. Investors are really looking to understand what companies are doing beyond their environmental footprint, beyond their governance issues, through to what they're actually doing um, for society. So modern slavery naturally forming a, a very big part of this. Um, and this has the knock on effect, of course, to, to this consumer demand issue as well. Um, everybody's starting to look at the private sector more and more to understand what they're doing in this space. So um, on the next slide, um, just to summarize kind of how the Mekong Club fits into this kind of quite large challenging world that I'm describing here. Um, so as I mentioned, we take all of these challenges and these issues that companies are facing related to modern slavery, and we look to build um, or identify tools and technologies that address these challenges. Um, often when companies first come to us, they're really looking to understand what this issue is. Um, then they're looking to enhance the policies and procedures that they have in place. Um, through to assessing and kind of understanding where their risk lies, bringing greater transparency to their supply chain, understanding how they can potentially mitigate that risk within their supply chains. And then we at the Mekong Club like to guide companies through to developing their skills uh, beyond just complying with legislation through to becoming industry leaders in this space. So this brings us to Katie. Um, we, uh, through, through our work in identifying wonderful tools that already exist out there, uh, engaged with the OAR. Um, this tool is a partner tool available on our website, on our toolkits page. Um, and as I mentioned, looks to uh, allow companies to demonstrate greater supply chain transparency. So without further ado, I will pass over to Katie. Um, quick reminder, if you do have any questions for her, feel free to drop them into the chat box as she's speaking. Thank you, Katie.
Great, thank you so much Phoebe for that introduction and um, hello to everyone that's joined this webinar today. Thanks so much for, um, for giving up your time to learn a bit more about the Open Apparel Registry. Um, my name's Katie, I'm the Chief Programme Officer on the Open Apparel Registry and um, in just a moment hopefully I'll be able to uh, I'll share my screen and I'm going to talk you through an introduction to the tool um, but then what I'll actually do is run a demo and we'll, we'll do some searches on the site because that's actually the best way to bring the power of the tool to light. So I will um, share my screen and hopefully you can now all see um, a presentation deck um, and uh, I will uh, start to work through that um, with all of you. So um, the other thing I want to mention, courtesy of the Great British Summer, I've managed to get a cold, so apologies if there's some sniffles over the course of this presentation. Um, but at a basic level, um, let's just start by understanding, some of you may have come across the Open Apparel Registry before, there's some names I recognise on the participant list, but to ensure that we all have a basic understanding of what the Open Apparel Registry is, it's a neutral and open source tool in which we're mapping garment facilities worldwide and we're allocating a unique ID number to each. And we'll go on to talk about that ID number in a bit more detail later on, because that's a really integral part of the tool in terms of how it's driving um, the sharing and exchange of data and enabling interoperability between different systems. And in terms of what we're trying to do with the Open Apparel Registry and, and what the tool does is it's creating this one common registry of facility names and addresses with that industry standard facility ID allocated to each facility in the database. And in turn, what that does is eliminates issues with matching across multiple inconsistent databases. So anyone who's joined this session today that has worked with data on apparel supply chains will know that it's often scattered around in all sorts of different databases of varying quality in different formats. And so by consolidating all of that information in a consistent format um, in one central uh, repository, in turn, we're able to, um, to help facilitate in-facility collaboration between different organisations. And that's something that we all know is crucial to so many of the different issues in um, apparel supply chains, not least um, when we think about um, modern slavery and people trafficking that is such a focus for the Mekong Club. So in terms of how the Open Apparel Registry work and how data makes it into the tool in the first place, anyone that has supply chain data about the apparel sector can upload lists directly to the tool. So what that looks like in practice is major global brands contributing data. We have civil society organizations like the Bangladesh Accord on Fire and Building Safety, or um, the Worker Rights Consortium sharing data on apparel supply chains. We've got certification schemes have started to contribute name and address data, as well as some of the big industry um, multi-stakeholder initiatives like HIG on behalf of the Sustainable Apparel Coalition and Zero Discharge of Hazardous Chemicals or ZDHC. So data about apparel, footwear and home textile suppliers is, updated, um, is uploaded to the Open Apparel Registry by contribution by contributors from industry but then we as the open apparel registry team are also regularly accessing publicly available data sets and adding that data to the tool as well we start with a very basic set of data so to create an entity in the open apparel registry all we need is the name and the address of that facility so we've got this really razor-like focus um, at, at the initial stages in improving the quality of name and address data in apparel supply chains. Because at a really basic level, if you've got no clear sense of where factories in the apparel sector are, how can you possibly have any sense of what the social or environmental conditions are at those facilities? So name and address data is uploaded to the tool. And then we have this powerful name and address matching algorithm that processes that data. So it goes through line by line, every entry to the open apparel registry. And using a statistical model, it's able to identify where a facility has already been contributed to the database. And in those instances, that facility is returned to the contributor as a match. But where an, an entity is being 
uh, uploaded to the tool for the first time, that gets created as a new facility in the tool and allocated its own OAR ID. And when we switch over to the demo, what you'll see in terms of the data that's published at the end of that process, there's a map of global apparel facilities. There's now over 63,000 facilities in the database. And for each facility on its profile, you can see the name, the address, the data source. So who are the organizations that have shared that facility data with the Open Apparel Registry? And then the unique OAR ID for each facility. You can then click through to understand a little more about the data contributors on their profiles. And the other point to mention, and a really integral part of our identity as an organization, and a big part of the reason that people are prepared to share their data with us, is that we are a neutral and open data platform, as I said. So all of the data um, in the Open Apparel Registry is governed under an open data license. It's something called a Creative Commons 4.0 license. And what that means is that there's an explicit understanding that any organization can make use of that data in the OAR for free depending on their particular needs. So just to kind of draw together um, what I've just explained, the Open Apparel Registry is, is a systematized registry. So it's about creating consensus in the way that we're um, logging and sharing data. Um, and it's a registry that's allocating these unique IDs to each facility. So I'll just reiterate what we do list, but also it's really important to understand what we don't list on the Open Apparel Registry. So as I said, name and address for each facility, that unique OAR ID for each facility in the tool. We return GPS coordinates for every facility in the database. You can see who has contributed name and address data for that facility, so the contributing sources. And then what you see is the variation in name and address data. So these slightly different ways that multiple organizations have of referring to the same, uh, to the same facility that has been identified by our algorithm as all pointing to the same place. We also accept facilities all the way through the supply chain. So this isn't just about tier one disclosure and we're starting to see more and more organizations contribute facility data beyond tier one of the supply chain. Um, the exception to that is that we don't go down to the raw material level. Um, there's a few different reasons for that, but probably the most pertinent one um, for the purposes of this conversation is that often raw material locations are people's homes. So if you think of cotton farms or, co or cattle ranches, um, and the challenge we have there is that we cannot have name and address data for people's homes on an open data platform that's freely accessible to anyone. It is also possible through a mechanism called claim a facility to share optional additional information about the facility and that can include um, services so um, what production is happening at that facility, what are the MOQs, what are the lead times for that facility and um, some entry level information about ownership structures so who is the parent company of that facility. And that's possible through a mechanism called claim a facility where facility owners or senior management uh, claim their profile on the OAR and are able to go through a process of adding additional information. In terms of what we do not show on the Open Apparel Registry, we are not a repository for audit history or scores from factory inspections. We also very deliberately don't list which tier a facility belongs to, um, nor do we map traceability between facilities. Um, we're not kind of looking to, to, uh, to move into the sort of sourcing platform territory or traceability platform territory. And as I mentioned previously, we don't go down to the raw material um, or farm level uh, in our data. So the Open Apparel Registry was built for the benefit of the entire apparel sector. So that can range from tiny civil society organizations operating on the ground in production countries, as well as right the way up to major global brands and retailers. Um, there's also benefits for facilities, which I hinted at um, by talking about the claim of facility mechanism and opportunity to have an up to date profile um, on a tool that's being used throughout the entire sector as well as the multi-stakeholder and other industry initiatives. I won't go through line by line um, what's written on this slide, very happy for this presentation to be circulated afterwards to all attendees. 
But what I will say is that the core benefit across all stakeholder groups of the Open Apparel Registry is access to better quality data, improved efficiency because of not having to manually cross check against different databases and data sets being uh, being housed in disparate, excuse me, in disparate uh, uh, in disparate places um, and also through the consistency um, and the sort of um, interoperability that's enabled through the OAR IDs that's really creating all sorts of benefits um, in terms of improving efficiency in systems and identifying much more rapidly what the opportunities for collaboration at the facility level might be. Um, so I'm just going to switch my screen share now so that we can uh, take a look at the tool and uh, I'll share some some sort of particularly powerful searches that I think um, that I think people would be interested in seeing. So hopefully you can now all see the open apparel registry on the screen. So. Uh, the right hand side should look very familiar to you all. Um, our geocoding is powered by Google. So that's a Google map that you can see with our data set overlaid on top. Um, and hopefully a very, uh, a very simple key or legend, which is the darker the blue, the greater the density of facilities at that particular point. And you can click these dots to zoom in and get right down if of interest to the individual facility level. But what I'll do is um, we'll spend some time in this left hand search bar and uh, I'll show you a few different searches as well as other ways that you can work in the tool. So what I'll actually do is um, we're really trying to flag at the moment that it is possible to use the OAR in over 120 different languages. So this is powered by Google Translate, so it's not perfect, but um, it is important that people are able to navigate the tool in their native language. So you can see um, that I just switched the language to simplified Chinese. Uh, for the purposes of this demo, I will switch back to English. Um, but just to let you know that, as I say, there are over 120 different languages in which you can navigate the Open Apparel Registry. What we can see on the left hand side is the search bar. You can see that there's well over 63,000 facilities in the database and then if you need to um, have a read through any instructions about how to create an account or search the tool we have the guide here but I'll show you the different ways you can search the tool. So if you know the name of a particular facility that you want to look up, um, you can search for that facility um, with a free text search. What you can also see here is the hundreds of different organisations that are now contributing data to the Open Apparel Registry. So you can see I've mentioned the Accord on Fire and Building Safety in Bangladesh. We've got major global brands like Adidas, Aldi, uh, both of the Aldis in here. Amazon is contributing data. Um, and all sorts of other civil society organisations. Um, and as I mentioned, we've got some certification schemes that are now contributing data to the tool as well. If there's a particular country that you're interested in, you can search by country. Um, and what I'll also mention is that you can search by um, all of these filters in combination. So if, for example, you wanted to take a look at um, Adidas uh, facilities in India, um, you can take a look at that and run a search just to return the facilities that Adidas is working with in India and you can see that there are 34 different facilities there. Anyone that's using the Open Apparel Registry can run searches and download data for free. So you can run a search without logging into an account. In order to download data, you will need to be logged in to a free Open Apparel Registry account. So you can just register for an account on this top menu bar. And as long as you ensure you're logged in, you can then download a CSV or an Excel file of any search that you run in the Open Apparel Registry. What I'll also show you over here is um, a way that if um, an organization has uploaded multiple different data sets to their account, you can see what that looks like in practice. So if we look at the Accord on Fire and Building Safety, you can see that this filter by contributor list um, dropdown appears. And what you can see here is that the Accord has shared three different data sets clearly marked with the Open Apparel Registry. So you can see that it shared a list of factories which have now closed in Bangladesh. 
you can see factories that are covered by the accord on fire and building safety but you can also see factories which are ineligible for business with the accord and what the Bangladesh accord has also gone on to do is show the date to which all of that data is current so in this instance they've done um, a data upload with with information current to the 3rd of May so those are a few different bits um, on the search mechanism here, but what we'll do is we'll take a good look at um, one example facility profile. So we'll run a search for AKH Eco and we should, all things being equal, land on a facility in Dhaka, Bangladesh. So this is what a profile for a facility in the Open and Power Registry looks like. So you can see the name and the address for the profile. We return um, for the facility, excuse me. You can see a Google Earth view, the OAR ID, and then the GPS coordinates. And then here is where it starts to get really interesting because you can see all of the slightly different variations in name and address data that in other systems would be recognized as an entirely separate facility. But our algorithm has picked up that, um, you know, you've got variations like all capital letters, you've got um, limited spelt as an acronym versus limited as all one word. Um, we've got some stray full stops. That's all been recognized by the algorithm as pointing to the same place. And then when we come down into the address details, you can see these slight variations again in uppercase and lowercase, but you can see that there's greater detail in some addresses than in others. So you can see that some entries have a zip code, others do not. Some go into more detail around the region and the province. Um, and so all, all of that is being gathered together. And for those organizations whose um, name and address data set isn't so strong, they're benefiting from better quality quality data about apparel supply chains. And then when we move down to the contributor section, this is where it becomes really interesting in terms of quickly identifying opportunities to collaborate at the facility level. So what you can see with this unit in Bangladesh is any, you know, um, a, a, a really decent number of global apparel brands that are manufacturing there. So you've got Target from the US, Next from the UK, Aldi, um, Woolworths Group over in Australia, all sourcing from this factory. But what you can also see is that it's been mapped by the initiative out of Brack University in Dhaka, mapped in Bangladesh. They're also contributing data to the OAR. Um, and you can see some of the multi-stakeholder initiatives that are connected to it as well, like HIG for the SAC, the Better Cotton Initiative, as well as the fact that this is certified by architects. So what becomes really interesting here is that the greater the number of contributors connected to this facility, the more interesting the data set becomes, because you can start to think through um, opportunities like how to more efficiently and effectively run um, worker improvement programs or environmental improvement programs at the facility level. And if you know who's connected to a facility it's much easier and much more efficient rather than sort of anecdotally knowing which other buyers are sourcing from the same factory as you by having this in a consolidated list the opportunities to uh, identify ways to work together um, are much more uh, are much more efficient what I'll do next is show you um, one further uh, a couple of further ways of searching the tools so um, if two organisations wanted to get together to identify where they share facilities, um, whether that's to, um, as I said, run, run shared worker improvement programmes or to understand what the coverage is of certified facilities in their supply chain, um, you could search for two different um, organisations in combination. So we'll start with Adidas and Nike and take a look um, at what happens here. So there's two different ways to run the search. When I entered the name of the second contributor in that list, this pop-up show only shared facilities appeared. Um, you can hover over this I button um, for more information, but what I'll do for the purposes of this demo is just run this search twice so that you can see the difference in results. So we have Adidas and Nike, and we're gonna hit search to understand the total number of facilities that have been contributed by both Adidas and Nike to the Open Apparel Registry. And you can see that there's over 1100 facilities in the database. We come back to the search button 
excuse me, to the search tab and now click this show only shared facilities button, we're going to see that this number will drop significantly because what will happen now is we'll only see the facilities that both Nike and Adidas have contributed to the Open Apparel Registry. So for any more tech minded people on this call, this is the difference between an and and an or search. Um, so we can see that that number drops to just 35 factories. And what you'll see here is that both Adidas and Nike are connected to the factories that have been returned through this search. What you'll also see is the additional contributors that are connected to those facilities. Um, and just to reiterate, you can download the results of these searches and then start to work with that data and integrate it into your systems in whatever way was useful for you to do that work. So that's just a little bit about the different combinations of how you can search different contributors. And the last thing that I'll do, um, which particularly when you're thinking about tackling modern slavery in supply chains, early on after the launch of the Open Apparel Registry, we heard from a lot of users that they were interested not just in country searches, but in regional searches. So that might be wanting to look across borders at facility coverage, but also looking at particular areas within a country that were of interest. And so what we have um, developed to respond to, to those needs and to that request is um, we've launched, we launched a mechanism um, called Area Search. And what you can do then um, with that search is zoom in to a particular area on the map that you're interested in, click this draw area button, and then you can draw a shape on the map with as many sides to that shape as you like. Um, it can be geographically wherever the particular region is that you're interested in. And when you close up that shape, that will return the facilities only in that area. So you can see that there are just under 4,000 facilities in the, in the totally random search area that I've just drawn on the map. And then what you can also do is use the filters on the search tab in combination with area search. So if you were interested in brands and retailers within that particular area, you can run the search again and you'll see that there are just under 2000 facilities there. Um, or if you had a particular organization whose data you wanted to look at in that particular area, you could also run a specific contributor search within that area to see what the results were. And again, there's 72 facilities that H&M has contributed to the Open Apparel Registry within that particular geographic region. So that's, that's a, a whistle stop tour of how to search the Open Apparel Registry. Hopefully it's a sort of very um, intuitive um, search interface um, and, and the power is in its simplicity. Um, I can see that some questions have popped up in the chat. So um, I will answer those whilst we're in uh, whilst we're in the demo mode, just in case I need to go back uh, on any of those. Um, so I can see from Stuart a question around standard holders and certifications. Um, so um, Stuart's asked a question around whether anyone is asking for OAR IDs of factories as an identifier requirement for facilities. Um, both HIG and um, ZDHC have connected with our API, which is an automated way of exchanging data with the Open Apparel Registry. And that's providing any facility that is registered on either the HIG or the ZDHC platforms, um, if they don't already have an OAR ID, to create an OAR ID, so to, to create an entry for uh, their facility on the OAR um, and uh, to then be able to display that on their HIG and their ZDHC profile because both HIG and ZDHC have seen the power of that industry standard OAR ID and want to have that um, displayed. Um, so I hope, Stuart, that answers your question. I think that's, uh, I think that's what you're getting at there. Um, the next question is information about who buys from who. Um, so with using the example of Nike or Adidas, do they actually have a buyer-seller relationship with the facility? So with brands contributing data to the Open Apparel Registry, you can infer that because that facility is on the brand's supplier list, um, 
that 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 brand is buying from that particular facility but what i will say is that it's always um if if you had a particular reason for needing to ask that question um worth contacting the brands directly to to sort of do your due diligence from that perspective um and then in terms of uh the next couple of questions where do you normally source public data lists from um that's a great question so in the contributor drop down what you'll see is that in some instances um, we have um, entries where in square brackets afterwards it says public list. So you can see that these are a couple of brands um, which say public list. And what that means is that that brand is not yet contributing and managing their own data in the Open Apparel Registry. And so in those instances, we as the Open Apparel Registry team have uh, done some research to identify more publicly available data sets we've um, formatted it and contributed it to the open apparel registry we always give these organizations the opportunity to take control of their data um, and some organizations just take a little bit of time to go through that process so the bulk of the publicly available data that we as the open apparel registry have sourced comes from brands but we do also have data sets like the better cotton initiative publicly available data is in the open apparel registry um, and we also have a data set from cotton made in africa which is publicly available data um, and uh and, and so we're starting to vary the uh, types of publicly available data in the open apparel registry um, and I can see another questions come in asking how often do we check for updated lists um, we are constantly uh, sort of on a weekly basis looking for um, more publicly available data sets um, what I will say is that with the brand data sets due to the size of our team um, we only commit to refreshing the brand data once per year. So another benefit for brands in taking control and managing their own data in the OAR um, is that they can refresh that data at the same cadence with which they're doing that work internally. So some brands are updating their supplier lists every month, some are doing that work every six months, and then there's a whole bunch of, um, of in-between stages where brands are updating their supplier lists every two to three months. Um, so they can they can do that work in the open apparel registry um, however frequently or infrequently that work is happening at the organizational level um, i can see a question from ken saying who is the one to maintain the information and keep it up to date in the oar um, from a brand perspective the products we source will change over a period of time so as i said it's up to brands to refresh their data um, where they control it in the open apparel registry as frequently as they wish um, we don't list um, if the concern is around the products we source will change over a period of time we don't at the moment list well we don't it's not listed what product a brand is sourcing from a factory um, but you can replace um, previous supplier lists so that if you're no longer working with a facility we don't delete that data from the open apparel registry because just because i don't know tesco has stopped working with a factory doesn't mean that that factory no longer exists so we want to keep it in the open apparel registry but what we will do is break the link between that brand that is no longer sourcing from the factory um, so that it's it's not associated with a factory that it isn't working with at that particular um, moment in time. Um, and then I can see a related question, which is how do you cope with the time dynamic, like one brand sources only from one year to another? So. Um, we have both up-to-date data but also historical data um, where that's available so in instances where brands manage the data themselves that's a fantastic opportunity to take advantage of the um, of the uh, multiple list functionality so if a brand wanted to share multiple different lists from different years um, about its supply chain then it's entirely up to the brand whether or not it wants to do that and then where historical data is available um, in the form of the public um, publicly available data sets we can upload that as well so in this instance with fast retailing this is a set of data that's controlled um, and managed by the open apparel registry team fast retailing hasn't taken that over yet 
So you can see that we've got different brand lists from the fast retailing group. Um, and we've got um, data available to different time frames. So you can see both um, the fact that they've got lists um, for their mills uploaded, um, but we've also got a variation of some data from 2018, some going as far back for GU to 2017, um, but also much more current data from March 2021. Um, and so the way I can see the question that's popped up about do you give the option to brands to declare they no longer source from the facility, that's how um, that is handled by replacing um, historical data with an up to date list and the visible link between that brand and a facility being broken so that um, you know Tesco would no longer appear on the facility list if it's replaced its 2020 list with the 2021 supplier list, any facilities that it's no longer working with um, will not have a public connection between Tesco and that particular facility. Great. Lots of good questions. Thank you, everyone. Um, do keep them coming. I'll um, just switch back to um, the final slides in the presentation just to wrap, uh, just to wrap everything up there. So, I just wanted to, oh, if I can get the slides moving again, um, just to consolidate kind of everything that I've spoken about so far and what we've seen in the demo. Um, the real power of the Open Apparel Registry is to facilitate that greater collaboration and efficiency for all stakeholder groups in the apparel sector through that common ID and through this data being openly available. So that OAR ID and then that really simple way that we're displaying data um, on facility profiles so that you can see the connections of those facilities enables efficient collaboration. And all of those different third party organisations which have shared factory relationships can quickly identify one another to work together on improvements. And then there's this point around interoperability. So data that was um, that is still currently or was previously sat in silos in different systems that can synchronize using the OAR ID. And then for the more technically um, advanced users who've got sort of um, the systems in place, a connection through the OAR's push-pull API, so a programmatic way of querying and sharing data with the system enables further data exchange. This is just a quick snapshot. You saw some of this through the contributor drop down, but this is um, a slide just um, sharing some examples of the different brands and retailers, the different factory groups and facilities that are making use of the OAR, as well as the multi stakeholder initiatives. So, the Dutch Agreement on Sustainable Garments and Textiles, um, HIG, the Social Labour and Con excuse me, the Social and Labour Convergence Program, ZDHC, we've already mentioned, and then a whole range of civil society organizations organizations who are both making use of the data but also contributing data to the tool. Um, I just wanted to share one quick example again given the focus of um, the, the Mekong Club and the work that um, that, uh, that, uh, that the Mekong Club is convening. Um, I wanted to touch on how Stop the Traffic um, is making use of Open Apparel Registry data. So for those of you who don't know Stop the Traffic it's um, an organized, a non-profit organization working to prevent human trafficking globally. And it does this through a kind of data and intelligence led approach. Um, and in terms of how they made use of the Open Apparel Registry, um, it's part of their work um, to collect global exploitation data from a whole range of sources. Um, and they work to overlay those multiple data sets to enable them to identify different hotspots um, for, um, for people trafficking and what trends they can infer from that data. And previously what they found was that aspects of this work could be really manual, could be really resource intensive and time consuming. And it was also difficult for, organization, for that organization for Stop the Traffic to identify the relevant sources and transform that the, the information they were, see, were receiving from an unstructured into a structured format. And what they found with the Open Apparel Registry is that the insights from the structured data, they're able to take those and apply those internally to enhance the impact of Stop the Traffic. Um, but they're also able to share um, the insights that they've gleaned from that data externally to assist with their work with global partners and other initiatives. 
Um, and so what they have shared with us is that, you know, the structured additional data source that the OAR provides increases their ability to identify potential exploitation hotspots, as well as global partners to work with on combating the issues. So I can see that we have had a couple more questions pop into the chat. Um, so Ken Chang, great question. Um, you've teed me up to uh, talk about a development that we should be launching in the next month or so. So how about a situation where the factory ceased operation and no longer exists? Um, so in the next month or so, we should be launching a mechanism where we can mark facilities as closed. Um, it's something that we've always wanted to do with the Open a Power Registry, and then the impacts of COVID have only exacerbated the need to make that information visible. Um, so uh, what I would say is sign up to our newsletter um, for news of when that feature is launched. Um, and what you'll see initially is a data set from research that we have conducted, as well as data that's been shared with us by organisations on the ground um, to confirm that facilities have closed. But there'll also be the opportunity to report that a facility has closed. So we'll ask for certain bits of information to verify um, to verify that closure report, and then that will be marked, and so it will appear on the Open Apparel Registry uh, as um, as a closed facility. Um, the next question I can see is, what is the motivation or incentive for brands to submit such data? So. Um, it varies from one organization to another, um, including in the brand case. So there are some brands that are now using the OAR IDs as their own internal ID schema. So they really recognize the benefits and the power of the OAR ID to enable interoperability and to, uh, and to solve this problem of factory identification. There's also a lot of brands who are benefiting from the improved quality name and address data that they're able to glean from the Open Apparel Registry. And then we're hearing more and more interest. There's so much talk about the need for collaboration within the apparel sector. Um, and the way that this data is displayed makes that very simple in terms of identifying which other brands are sourcing from the same factories as you. So, you know, many of you may have heard similar stories of um, an instance where two major global brands ran a worker improvement program at a factory and unbeknownst to them, they both run the same worker improvement program at the same facility. So all sorts of concerns there in terms of the amount of time, money and resource that had been invested in that program. But also what that means is that you have programs being run twice in one factory and not at all in another. Whereas if you've got that better understanding of shared facilities, you can think in a much more, um, you, can, you can be much smarter with your allocation of resources. And then to some of the points that Phoebe was making at the start, it's an opportunity for brands to demonstrate their commitment to transparency. So sharing data on a publicly available open platform where people can make very practical use of that data is a real um, is a real indication from that brand um, of their commitment to uh, greater transparency in the apparel sector. I can see another question about are we validating claims of certifications against the data from certification agencies? No, is the short answer to that question. So on facility profiles that have been claimed, there is a disclaimer from us as the Open Apparel Registry saying that what we have validated to the best of our ability is that the person who has claimed that profile is who they say they are. So they have a particular role at a factory that means they are qualified and trusted to share additional data points. But we are not doing due diligence to check um, membership of multi-stakeholder initiatives or uh, certification schemes. So um, that um, the responsibility to conduct that due diligence lies with the user of the data. I will just um, move on to the next slide. If there are any further questions, very happy to help, but um, I'll just uh, have this slide here so that you can all see how you can get involved um, and both make use of and help grow the Open Apparel Registry. Um, so, you know, exploring the tool, sharing data with the tool. Um, and if you want to keep up with our, um, our latest news, you can sign up for our newsletters or follow us on social media. 
Thank you so much, Katie. That was a really interesting session and it's great to see the tool in action. Um, so I'm just also going to drop uh, our website into the chat as well. Um, if anyone has any questions or wants to get in contact with either uh, Katie or myself at the Mekong Club, do feel free to reach out to us and we'll be happy to help. Um, as I mentioned, this tool is now also available via the Mekong Club website's toolkit page as well. So I encourage you to go check out that page and see all of the other great modern slavery related tools that we have there. Um, so with that, we will close up. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you for the wonderful questions. We will circulate a recording um, later in the week of this session and wishing you a fantastic day ahead. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.